All right, so we're going to get started with Charlie Bird Parker. And Charlie Parker, who died at a very young age, at the age of 34, sort of uh, changed the way people thought about how to play the saxophone. He played alto saxophone. And in the, in the mid 40s was when the music bebop started to develop as a music coming out of the swing era. And although those musicians who played bebop later uh, were a part of the swing era, they were just teenagers. So by the time they got into the 40s, maybe 45, they were 20, 22, 21 years old. Some of them were even teenagers. They started playing this music called bebop. And it was Charlie Parker that sort of opened the gateway for it because the swing bands were breaking up because after the 30s, there wasn't enough finance for people to afford to bring in bands of that size. And so many people started putting together bands that were smaller, mostly quartets and quintets. So Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, who plays trumpet, were the proponents of bebop. And along with them was also Bud Powell, who played piano, Charlie Mingus, who played bass, and Max Roach, who played drums. And so the first piece that we're going to hear today is called Salt Peanuts. And this song uh, was recorded, actually this song took place, let me get my notes here. This song was comes from a, a gig that they played in Toronto. And it is called Salt Peanuts. And it, it includes Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, Charlie Mingus, and Max Roach. Okay, here we go. to play like Max during that period, all of the drummers back then played the bass drum with the quarter notes on the bass drum. Boom, 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 boom. It was later on that Tony Williams reinvented that by playing the, playing the hi-hat cymbal on all, on all four beats. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and making it a lighter feeling. Later on, Max sort of um, went away from playing the bass drum that loud. Although even the younger drummers, including myself, we all made sure that we, what we call feathered the bass drum. So in other words, you would not hear the bass drum more than you would feel it. And the reason why drummers in, in that era played the drum, bass drum so loud, because in big bands, in those days, the bass, the, the, the bass fiddle, the, the upright bass player, bass violin, was not able to be heard because they didn't have amplification. So what they did was the bass drummer played the bass drum that way so that you could almost hear the bass drum have melody because you would hear the bass notes along with the bass drum. And so that's the way the bass fiddle was able to, to get through. Very good observation on your part, Carlos. Very good observation, yes. And so you also notice that when Max, anytime you listen to Max Roach, it's, it's, it's not as, uh, today when we notice it, it's not as noticeable as it was back then, but Max was one of the first drummers to play melody on the drum kit. In other words, you could follow the form of the song by listening to Max. If you hum the melody of the song, you could hear when he was in the first eight, the second eight, and then the bridge and the last eight, which would add up to what we talked about last week, 32 bar song. The American Songbook, 32 bars. All of the great tunes have 32 bars. And that's another point I want to make that, um, 
those songs that were jazz songs back then were songs that were made famous by Broadway plays. And the jazz musicians would take those songs and put a jazz treatment on it. And in so doing, would transfigure it into a jazz song. So that's what we refer to as jazz, as standards. So when musicians, when you hear jazz musicians speak about standards, we're talking about the songs that came out of these great Broadway plays that were hits. And the jazz musicians took those songs and played songs, those songs, and put their own treatment on it. Those are standards. Now there's a difference between standards and jazz standards. Jazz standards are songs that were written by, uh, by that were written by jazz musicians that became a part of the repertoire of other jazz musicians. And you just heard one. That was a jazz standard. It was not a song that appeared in a Broadway play but it is a song that had the same chord progressions as I Got Rhythm. I got rhythm, I got rhythm. It's the same chord progressions, but a different melody on top, okay? So now let's move to the next one. Now that's bebop. And there's plenty, plenty examples of bebop. If you go to YouTube, you will find plenty examples of bebop of that era. Now we're going to move a little past that to hard bop. Before we get to hard bop though, I want to mention that what I said earlier about uh, the birth of the cool. The birth of the cool was a, a movement that was established by the great Miles Davis. And this was after his tenure with Charlie Bird Parker. After he died, uh, Miles wanted to hear a different kind of sound. So he put together a group of musicians, which included the writing of the great Gil Evans. And also the musicians, um, some of them would be, would be um, John Lewis on piano, who was also a member of Modern Jazz Quartet, and also Gary Mulligan, who was a baritone saxophonist, Lee Konitz, who just died last year, a great alto player, who I had the, 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 the honor and pleasure and privilege to perform with a couple of weekends in, in early in my career, and Max Roach, who you just heard on drums. And The Birth of the Cool, their music had their orchestration and instrument choices were a little different than what you heard in a, in a jazz band, but their music was sort of more laid back. It was didn't have a lot of the fire of what you just heard. It had more orchestration. And so what I would do, rather than to, to, to find examples of this, I wanted to mention it to you, but I want you to put write down that term, birth of the cool. And it later became very big in California. And what's the distinction between hard bop and bebop? Well, the distinction is that hard bop, the songs that you heard there were more bluesy, were more um, what they would refer, refer to as funkier. They, meaning uh, F-U-N-K, meaning that it had more of an urban sound and, and utilized the blues a whole lot more. And so we're gonna play this next song is, is uh, a song that was um, put together by Horace Silver. It's a Horace Silver, pianist Horace Silver, who was, who was uh, Cape Verdean, by the way. And those who originated in Cape Verdean came from Port Portugal by way of Brazil. And so Cape Verdean uh, is what he, what was, was his nationality. And he wrote songs that were very interesting and bluesy. Also, the first song that I played for you, which illustrated call and response, was played by Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. 
Well, this was the first version of the Jazz Messengers before it had Art Blakey's name on it. Had, how it went is that Horace Silver decided to form a band and went to Art Blakey and said to him, I have the band together. Now all we need is you to lead us. And that's how the, the, the messengers were formed. Horace decided to leave the band and move out on his own. And then Art Blakey's name became in front of Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. So this is the same concept. So I hope you enjoy this. This is a very interesting song. <laughs> All right, so you notice two things, that you had a dance beat, it, it was at a moderate tempo, and sometimes there are ballads, and sometimes uh, it is moderate tempo, uh, and sometimes it's in three quarter time, and so it, it changes. The, the whole idea is what is the structure? And so in Deep Bop, we started to see very fast paced angular solo that the musicians were in and out of the chord progressions much more actively than you heard during the swing era. In the swing era, you heard musicians stick closely to the scale of the chords that were being played. And in bebop, you hear musicians using more uh, angular and, and, and more wider intervalic expressions to and to express their harmony through um, the chordal structure of the song. If we had more time, I could even demonstrate it for you, but just, just know that that's what's going on there. Uh, so what you heard is also the blues. You heard a 12 bar blues, and you also heard a churchy sound, the preacher. And so that's what that was really all, all about. It was the blues, it was a 12 bar blues and it was danceable and it had a, a slight backbeat uh, on, the, on the snare drum by Art Blakey. Now we're going to move forward, but before we do, I want to, uh, the, the, the style of music that I could not come up with before is third stream. Third stream came a little after the birth of the cool and that, Third Stream was named such by composer Gunther Schuller, who also supported and, and expressed interest in who we're going to listen to later on, Ornette Coleman, who was uh, considered an avant-garde musician. But Gunther Schuller named this music Third Stream, and why? Because it included also not only bebop, and birth of the cool, which they call cool jazz, but it also included classical. And you will find that in the music of the modern jazz quartet, uh, also known as the MJQ, which included John Lewis and Milt Jackson. And um, I would uh, suggest that you also go online and listen to their music if you're not familiar with it to hear why it is called third string. And you can hear the impressionistic sounds of classical music, orchestral music, and also bebop. Okay, so now we're gonna move forward to our next selection with, um, this will be Miles Davis. And the name of this is So What? And it is based upon mode. And this is when things changed a little bit in 1959 with Miles Davis and So What. And this also includes a young musician at the time who was named John Coltrane, who we will talk about after this. Okay, here we go. Thank you, thank you, because I know we, we, we're short on time. I wanted you to especially, especially to make notice of 
how Miles approached his way of soloing. And John Coltrane even went even further. John Coltrane was the one that played the tenor saxophone. This idea of playing over the molds um, in this particular song, the, the mode was Dorian, meaning that if you take the C scale and you go a step up to D and play those same notes that appear in the C scale, you have the Dorian mode, which means that there, there is much more that you can do with it in a mode setting. It, it, it gave the, the musicians freer ways to express. But what, what else was important? You started to hear and see that the piano player was not confined in his chords to play the third note of the chord, meaning that the third note is what determines, the third in the scale determines whether the scale is major or minor. And if you flat the seventh of the scale, then you have the dominant chord. Well, you can, if you flat the seventh in the scale and the third in the scale, then you have um, a, made, a minor chord with the flat at seven. But if you take that third out of the chord and still play the, 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 the seventh that is flatted, you have the dominant chord. So this may not mean anything to you, but it helps you to understand that if you take the third out of the chord, that it opens up the chord to a suspended chord, which means that it can be any chord. And you can take that chord and leap around all over the place just because you have taken the third out of the scale. And I, I wanted you to understand that. So when you hear these musicians play this style, it's because it helps us to be freer in our expression and we're not bogged down to, it, it's like buying a car that doesn't have its manufacturer's name on it because you built the car. You know, you got a you got a Chevy engine and you got a Ford chassis and you, you see what I mean? And we we will go on like that. Now the next piece that we're going to go into is I, I will mention that while John Coltrane was performing with Miles Davis, it is Miles that introduced John Coltrane to playing in the mold fashion. So when John Coltrane left Miles' band to form his own band, his whole, it, his, his format was the modes. And so I'm going to, now the next piece that we're going to play is going to take us for a ride. This is a, a, a song from the suite that John Coltrane wrote, which is the greatest suite, the greatest one of his greatest recordings is still selling. It's called A Love Supreme. And it featured the musicians, all of the musicians, a quartet on this particular piece became famous in their own right just because they played with John Coltrane. All of them are, are gone. The pianist who was the youngest in this band at the time may have been 19 or 20 years old. He was the youngest in the band. He just left the planet last year. He died at the age of 81, McCoy Tyler. Elvin Jones on drums changed the way drums were played. He should, Carlos, you know that. He played, he, everyone now, after all jazz drummers now, have to reference Elvin Jones because he changed the drums so much. But Elvin Jones will tell you that he listened to Max Roach, Roy Haynes, and Philly Joe Jones. And I know because he told me. Now we're going to listen to this and please know this is very energetic and it may not be as easy to follow, but you can hear the modality in it.
that was, uh, I would suggest when you get an opportunity to go into YouTube and listen to the complete album of A Love Supreme. Um, because that is the point where John Coltrane expressed to the world community of his belief in God and his service to God and that his music would be of service to God. I was 17 years old when I first heard this music and that gave me the foundation for what I needed to realize that I had to give my music to the service of God and the belief in God and the belief in God's existence. And if a music or any act is not first propagated by the service to God, then that act does not have its fullest power. So I'll, 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 I'll now move on to, but please, please listen to A Love Supreme. Um, there is a song on A Love Supreme called Songs. And there is also on the jacket of A Love Supreme, and you may find, I think you'll find it online, that he wrote out a, his service to God in the form of text. When you hear that last song, Psalms, he is playing on his horn what he wrote out, and you can follow exactly what he's saying. All right, so let's move on to the next piece, and we're going back now to Ornette Coleman. Ornette Coleman came out with a, uh, this piece came out in 1961, and uh, I believe that um, this piece is called Free Jazz. And this piece, if you want to call a music, a jazz music avant-garde, you have to start here. How you like that? Now, <laughs> so lots of times you'll see me when the music is going on and I'm bobbing my head and I'm doing, I do that usually, but I was doing that purposefully, intentionally, just so that if you didn't know where the beat was, that's where it is, you know? And, um, but Ornette Coleman, uh, later on, John Coltrane sort of, Ornette Coleman is the, is the one that everyone else later on started to follow. And because John Coltrane went through all of the periods of being able to play uh, the American Songbook and, and uh, follow chord structures, he was accepted readily when he went into this area. But many of these other musicians were not. And they, although they could play what we call changes, they did not always demonstrate it once they became known as avant-gardists. And so Ornette Coleman was the first one to, to, to move that way. Now let's go back to, we've got to move forward now. You still with me? Everyone? Good, 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 good. I didn't lose anybody. No fatalities yet. Okay, good. So now this, we're going back to Miles Davis. And in this piece is a fusion piece. And Miles is the proponent of fusion. And the drummer in his band at the time, we would consider as being the drummer that led Miles in the direction of fusion because when he joined Miles' band, he was 16 years old. At this point, he was around 20, maybe 19. And so he was inspired by what was going on and so was Miles. And so this piece is called Miles Davis uh, Filet de Kilimanjaro. And uh, when we get into it, uh, 
Sam, uh, Samantha, would you fast forward because it starts as a waltz and I want you to listen to this on your own so you can hear it. It starts as a waltz, but eventually the drummer, Tony Williams, starts to superimpose duple time, which is the two beats over one beat in this waltz. It was one, two, three. He goes one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, right there. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. So you're going to listen to this on your own. Carlos, did you notice the hi-hat symbol? Chick, 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 chick. That took the place of the bass drum, boom, 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 that Max was doing. So it's still there, it just, it just switched over. Now we're going to go real quick to uh, another, um, another Miles Davis, and, uh, which is important because Miles changed the music at least four or five times. Uh, from bebop to birth of the cool to modal to fusion. And uh, so now this next piece is we're further along uh, and this is called Miles Runs the Voodoo Down. And I want you to listen to this because we talked about the one chord blues. This is a one chord blues. <laughs> Thank you. So you notice that that chord didn't change. That was one chord that they grooved over. And that one chord can cause all kinds of things to go on inside the body. First of all, you're gonna to start to move, you're gonna to start to groove, and miles are hitting those blue notes. And uh, that was, an, that. this is a seminal, they referred to this as a seminal fusion record because this came out in 1969 Miles is the one that changed from this record here. This is what changed many musicians from playing bebop, blues, bass blues to fusion. And on that, it was also modal. So they went from, from modal and also to urban rhythms straight eighth note rhythms versus quarter note rhythms and a lot of other colors in between. So I'll, 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 I'll leave you there with the music. There's one more song there that was written, not written, but played by Tony Williams, which is a song written by John Coltrane. And I want you to listen to that and go back and listen to the original, Big Nick. And go to my website and subscribe because I play all of this music. I, I, you know, my heart is with the more edgy music. I love edgy music that's on the edge, but I also, uh, I have a heart. And so I like more tender things as well. I write tender things too. So come on out. Bye-bye.